I have two prayers. I'll go ahead and do them back to back. Heavenly Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, the Triune God, we give you praise, honor, and glory for who you are. We revere and understand you are the creator, you are the savior, and the defender of our souls. God, in this type of uncertainty for humans, you know the beginning from the end and all time between. We know you bless those who serve you and yearn for salvation of all who do not know you or refuse to know you. God, we pray for all who are affected by this virus, for those suffering and those in pain from loss of loved ones. More than all prayers we could pray, we pray and declare our repentance for not putting you first in all things. And we pray for untold numbers of people who will turn to you, yes. repent of their sins, yes. and ask that the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior be applied for their salvation, thereby accepting and giving their lives to serve the one true Savior and God. For you alone are worthy Amen. holy Amen. and incomprehensible in the love, mercy, grace, and covering you pour out on your servants every moment of every day. Thank you, Heavenly Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And for the first responders, my granddaughter is a health care worker. And I heard from her, and our hearts have been crying out for first responders, military, nurses and doctors, police, rescuers, and all who stand in the gap to serve and protect. I thank you, God, for giving a measure of strength that exceeds God. I thank God for giving you courage that allows you to run towards danger so others can be saved. I thank God for showing all of us through you what it means to put others first. I thank God for showing us your bright light in the darkest times. I pray that today and every day you feel the love and support of those whose lives you have saved and changed, of the community you protect, and of God who gives you all strength. Amen. 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 Even, you, you know, one of the things that uh, someone asked me about, what are the prophets saying? And you know what the prophets are saying? Nothing. They're silent. Many are speaking and giving their, uh, what they feel is going on, but not a direct word. God is up to something. And we can trust Him. We can believe Him. We can know that I, I believe He's getting ready to start another awakening. He's getting ready to shake us and, and use us like we've never been used before. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Emmanuel Worship Center. Thank you. Thank you for coming out, and thank you, our guests, for making this a very special day. I'm so glad that we can still be together. Even if you have to stay in automobiles and be six feet apart, I'm glad that we're here, that I can look out and see your faces. I can hear the horns as they are, are sounding because you're agreeing with the Word of God this morning. Thank you and bless you. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but, you, you know, I, I'm one of those preachers. I, I like those sermons, you know, the ones that, that, that gets you excited, that wants you to shout. I like the ones that make you want to clap your hands and make a little, movie, uh, make a little dance or something. You, you know what I'm saying? It make, makes you want to blow your horn. <laughs> I, I, I love those kind of messages, but i got to tell you, I don't think this is one of them. <laughs> I, I love, you know the ones I'm talking about, though. You know the ones that says, greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. 
The one that says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus with strength in me. The one that says, with God, nothing is impossible. The one that preaches and builds us up and tells us we're not the, we're the head and not the tail, that we're an overcomer. I love those. But I, I don't think the next sermon on these messages is going to be quite the end. They might be. It, it may be. Because you see, what we're going to do is over the next several weeks, we're going to pick up where we left off on our series concerning the Potter's House. We started a series several weeks ago, and we preached three of the six messages, and then all of this began to happen. We felt we led the Lord to go to another direction for several weeks, but now I feel like God wants us to come back to this series. And here's the deal. This is why God gets in our business. Hello? This way it gets real. This is why the Spirit gets right up in our face and He deals with some real tough issues in real life. And that's what He's doing now during this pandemic. It's one of those where the one writing the message needs to be in the audience with you listening to the message. It's one where we, we wish so-and-so was here or we wish so-and-so could have heard this, but guess what? They're not hearing the Holy Spirit saying, I'm glad you are here. It's one of those where we kind of smile from ear to ear and uh, say, Amen. But inside we're saying, Oh boy, he's at the front door of my house. Uh oh, he done come into my house. It's one where God is saying, If you listen to what I'm saying, if you hear what I am saying, then the Word and the Spirit will change you and will bring you up higher. And you will live a victorious life. How many of you want to live a victorious life? Amen. Oh, yeah. Listen. You know, hopefully today, I don't know about you, but I, I hope today that if you've been serving the Lord for any length of time, I, I'm hoping that you, like me, that you hope that you're further along this year than you were last year. In fact, I'm hoping that I have grown some wood in the past 50 years since I've been walking with Christ. I would, I would hate to think that I'm like some Christians. Here I am, a 55-year-old Christian, still wearing diapers, still immature, because I haven't grown in Christ. Now, I don't mean that I'm just older. And I don't mean that circumstances and things in my life have changed because I am old, still good looking. I have to depend on my wife for that. I didn't get no points for Thank you for one. <laughs> but two, <laughs> I, I don't mean that I'm, I'm just older and circumstances in my life are not changing. You know, because the fact of it is, in this past year, this, these past several months alone, it has changed a great deal for each and every one of us. But I pray that we are growing during this time. I'm praying that we are making an effort to go further in Christ and to grow in the Lord. Over the years, I've been shaped and reshaped. I've been created and recreated. And I can look back on my life and I can see that I've been living on the potter's wheel. Because you see, the potter's wheel is life itself. I can see how that God has used people. And God has used relationships, both good and bad. God has used my successes and my failures. He's used our circumstances. He's used life experiences. He's used things that we've done and left undone. He's used choices that we've made and opportunities that we failed to take advantage of. He's used joys and sorrows and disappointments and regrets. And yes, our successes and accomplishments. And surely... During our lifetime, in serving Christ, we have experienced Romans 8, 28. Amen? Because God takes all things. The scripture says that all things, that means the good, the bad, and the ugly. All things work together for the good to them who love God and are called according to His purposes. So even what we're going through right now, God will use this in a way to bless his church, to build his church, to bless his people, and to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. If you believe it, say amen. When we begin this series of messages, we talk about God's purposeful will. 
Let me say it again. God's purposeful will. Isaiah 14, 24. That's his will that nothing can deter it. That's his will that no matter what man's free will, the devils of hell, nothing can keep that from coming to pass. That is his will that we'll see fulfilled in Revelation 20 through 22. But we also talk about God's preferential will. That's God's desire for us. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. When we read what, about his thoughts towards his, us, his plan for us. Jeremiah, God says, I, I know my thoughts towards you. I know the plans that I have for your life. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, they're good thoughts. They're not thoughts of evil. They're not bad thoughts. There are thoughts for you good, to give you a hope, and to give you a future. That's God's desire for us. That's God's preferential will for us. But guess what? That's our choice. It's our choice. But if we choose so, God will use the potter's wheel to bring those things about. It's just real that all be saved, but we know that it's not going to take place. Not all will be saved. That will be those who would choose not to serve our Lord and Savior. But God chooses good things for us if we would choose Him. And the purpose of the potter's wheel is to complete in us His desire. You see, Isaiah 64, 8 tells us that God the Father is the potter. See, God is the person. The three persons of a God here are all involved in seeing that we finish our course. And if you notice this morning, several of the songs we sung talked about the one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he's, 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 all three are involved in seeing that we finish our course, that we complete our race. Our lives are not in the hands of some invisible force, nor are we subject to what is called blind faith. Our lives are in the hands of a person, a person like no other person, a, a being like no other being. There's no other being in existence or have ever existed that's like our God, Yahweh. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but He loves us beyond who we can even call for Him. God's not just our Creator, but He is our Father, and He has a personal concern this morning for the lives of His children. So Isaiah 64, 8 reads, But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. And you are the potter. And we all, talk about the believers now, we all the believers are the work of your hands. See, God didn't save you and say, Well, good luck. But you see, God has a plan for your life. You see, God saved us for a, pur for a purpose. God saved us on purpose for a purpose. God saved us on purpose for a purpose. And just as a potter has a plan for that lump of clay, so God has a plan for our lives. And guess what? He sees the finished product. And you know what that finished product is? that we're made to the image of Jesus Christ. Just as a potter already has a vision of what he is making, or is going to make out of that clay, and he already sees it in his mind's eye, God already sees us complete in his Son. Now that's difficult for us to understand, especially when we look in the mirror, or we're alone with our thoughts, because we deal with the flesh. We deal with some ugly things in our lives. Sometimes we don't always act pretty. Sometimes we act ugly, even to one another as Christians. But I believe as we begin to view our lives, I believe that you'll find that even the things in our life that seem insignificant, the things that, that, that doesn't seem to, to mean a great deal, I believe that you'll find if you begin to look and at at our daily lives, at these things that may seem a little consequence, that you will see that God is at work. God is at work. You see, being on a potter's wheel is not always comfortable. Amen? But Paul said over in Philippians 1 6, he said that being confident of this thing, and you and I can be confident of this when we're on the potter's wheel. No matter how uncomfortable life may be at times, 
No matter how difficult things may be at times, we can be assured and have confidence in this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will be performing until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Do you know what that means? Until the day when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's when God will make us and prepare us for the groom that we will be without spot and we will be without wrinkle and we'll stand there in the holy of holies, finally being made complete, finally being made holy, never to deal with this old flesh again. Amen. So we're all on the potter's wheel. And the things that we face in life are not just a coincidence. Do you think this pandemic surprise God? Do you think that tomorrow is going to surprise God? He's eternal. Amen? He lives in a, in a, a spirit a, 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 that we cannot understand. It's called eternity. It, it, it's an eternity that, that He sees everything. The past is as real to Him as the present and the future is as real to Him as the present because He sees it all. He's looking down. You know, if we're standing looking at a table far away and we kind of, and, and there's a plate of food on it, and we're about eye level with that plate of food, we can just about make out maybe what's on, the, on, on that plate of food, food. But when we're standing over top of the table and we're looking down on that food, we know exactly what's in that plate. And I want you to know, God knows what's exactly in the plate. Amen? And I believe he's preparing us a great plate. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now all of us have no doubt in the past faced situations that we did not like. But we were very uncomfortable. And don't doubt, no doubt many of us are right there now during this pandemic. Life has changed greatly. It's very uncomfortable. Especially since no one really knows what tomorrow holds. But even before this pandemic, many of us, some of us, well, I say we're going to be real, so all of us experienced some things uncomfortable, but somehow we managed through them, or we managed to keep them hidden, or pushed down, and not have to deal with them. But guess what? We're having to deal with them now. God's making us face some real issues in our life. In the past, maybe it was someone in the office or the workplace where your personalities didn't click or you got on each other's nerves. Now it's in your house. I mean, family members, your next door neighbor getting on your last nerve. I mean, now you get upset when somebody eats the last cookie or the last donut. Here's one I'm glad I'm not, I have not had to deal with for several weeks, and that's the traffic. Everyone driving crazy on the interstate. I came home one day, and my wife asked me, Jack asked me, she said, well, what's wrong with you? I said, man, it was crazy driving out there on the interstate today. Everybody was driving like I do. And many times that's the problem that we have on the interstate with people is, and you know it's the truth, they're driving like you and I do. Amen. But it's easy to get frustrated these days. It's easy to allow the flesh to control us rather than the spirit. We can't go to church like we used to. We can't, can't be in person with each other. We can't hug each other. Our favorite restaurants are closed. We can't go to a movie. We can't go to a ball game. I never thought that I would see myself up at 6 o'clock in the morning waiting for an hour at Walmart so the doors was open so I could run in. That was 100 people behind me. I was number two in line. And we ran in. I didn't get a basket. I ran right to where the toilet tissue was. And I know there was 100 people behind me and there was about 20 packages of toilet paper. Thank God we didn't cancel our newspaper. But many of us are thinking, when is this going to change? When is God going to do something? What makes you think he's not already doing something? Hello? But, but when, when is, is God going to change all of this? Can I tell you, that's exactly what the saints of God on the altar in Revelation, the sixth chapter, is asking the angels to ask the Father. When are you going to bring all this to a close on earth? 
When are you going to stop all the suffering, all the evil, all the sin? When is it going to happen? The Father said, wait, just be a little bit patient, a little bit longer. My plan's not finished yet, but it will be. Amen? It will be. But can you know what? I, I've learned one thing. I've learned I cannot pray, and I cannot will away every difficulty. But the Lord whispered to me the other day, he said, but Ken, in every difficulty, you can give thanksgiving and praise. The Apostle Paul said it. He said that we not for the difficulty, but no matter what we're going through, we can give thanksgiving and praise for one reason and one reason only. And that is because God is still God. He's still on the throne. And I must recognize that God used difficulties to do a work in us. I'm not saying God causes them, but God will use them. I mean, is this good? Is this all right this morning? I mean, God will use this pandemic just like he used the circumstances in Joseph's life. And it's time like these where God will use it as an opportunity to promote those people, those children of his who will stand stronger and will be more determined than ever to walk in by faith and not by sight. And I believe all of us have to admit right now we're in a time in our experience of our Christian life and in our walk of life that we are walking by faith and not by sight. But it's time we draw nigh to God and realize that it is in difficult times that the church grows. Look at the early church commanded to go to the world by the Lord. And yet they got contented. They, they loved the blessing. They loved the fellowship. They loved meeting in the houses and sharing bread and worshiping and all. And then all of a sudden, persecution came. And when the persecution came, it spread them throughout the known world again. And it spread them throughout the known world. God used that as an opportunity to take the gospel of Jesus Christ all the way to Rome to Caesar's house. And God would use this. If you and I would just commit more to Christ, I, I, I mean, when's the last time we checked to see how our neighbor was going? Hello? How they were doing? Uh, uh, the person down the street? Uh, 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 the one across the street? And use as an opportunity to say, you know what? God's a good God. God's in this for us. Many of you have heard me say this before, and I believe it bears repeating. But you see, when Sarah asked Abraham to... Uh, to have a child with her handmaiden, that was contrary to God's will. But in doing so, they operate in the flesh, trying to help God. Can I tell you, any time we operate in the flesh, trying to help God, it brings a lot of pain and suffering and discomfort. Amen? However, we saw the principle of, eight, of Romans 8, 28, even operating in the Old Testament. Because when Joseph, who was the great-great-grandson of Abraham, when he was thrown in the pit to die, it was the Ishmaelites. It was Abraham's descendants from Israel. It was Abraham's mistake, his mess, that God used to spare Joseph, which should encourage us to realize that God would take the messes of our past, take the failures of our past, take the things that was difficult of our past, and he would use it to bring glory and completeness to his plan. Why? Because he's a potter. He's not worth the clay. So several weeks ago, I began this series with Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. Jeremiah's told to go down to the potter's house and observe the potter and the clay of the potter's wheel. So I want to revisit those scriptures this morning, and this is part four of that message. And I have to come to a close. It's almost time to end it. So let me read it. Jeremiah 18, verse 1 through 6. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Don't you want to hear a word this morning? Arise and go down to the potter's house, and that I will cause thee to hear my words. Now, this is a rhema word to Jeremiah. You know what a rhema word is? That's when it's a word spoken directly to someone from God. We have this whole word, but there are times when we read the word of God that we get a rhema word. Hello? That's when God takes his scriptures, make them alive to us today, and speak directly to us. See, God was speaking directly to Jeremiah as a rainbow word. But there's something here that God wants to speak directly to us as a rainbow word. 
So you see that Jeremiah is a prophet used of God. Mainly, most of his time, most of the time, Jeremiah was sent out from God to deliver a message to the people. But here, God is telling Jeremiah, listen, I'm not giving you a message. I want you to go down to the potter's house. I want you to observe the potter and the clay on the potter's wheel because I have a message for you to hear. See, here, God wants Jeremiah to observe, Jeremiah to listen, Jeremiah to learn. That's a good listen, a lesson for us ministers. There are times we ought to speak, but there are times we need to hear, to listen. And so he obedience, verse 3. And then I went down to the potter's house and behold. Now we know what that word in the English means, but when we go at it in its original language, it, it takes on a, a deeper meaning. It means that, that now we, we, we are to observe. We're, we're to focus on this one thing. We will forget the things around us. You forget the things in the past. Forget what you have uh, sent you out to minister before. Well, forget what, uh, what you prophesied before. But right now, Jeremiah, I want you to observe and pay attention because this is what I want you to see. I want you to see this. And so it says he wrought. That word in the Hebrew, I can't pronounce it. And when I even try to pronounce it. But I can tell you how it's translated in different places in the Old Testament. It's translated to make an offering. It's translated, this is, to make useful. To make useful. It's translated to squeeze or to apply pressure. It's used to be filled up. And so that word means it. To make an offering, to be useful, to squeeze or apply pressure, to, to make it usable. And so it says that he wrought a work on the wheels. See, he was making something that can be used. He was making something not to be thrown away. In other words, listen now. He was not making something simply to sit on a shelf and look pretty. Hello? See, the Hebrew here is saying it was something that had to be used. And when he made it, it was to be filled with something. And I want you to know, when I begin to realize this, my, 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 what do you think it is? I mean, thank it, you and our church, we, that God will use us as a vessel of honor. But first, he wants to fill us with his spirit, to fill us with Christ, to fill us with his love. Ephesians 5.18, Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. So in the verse, fourth verse, he realized that here was a, a vessel that was to be used. A vessel that was to be, not set on a shelf, but to be filled with something. And then he noticed this. In the vessel that he made of clay, remember where the clay was marred. Now, in our previous three messages, we discussed this word. In the Hebrew, again, it has to be taken into context as it was written. But it means to spoil. It means to be ruined. It means to be corrupt, to be perverted, to be destroyed. Again, it depends upon the context of the scripture. And so the special that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made that word made is in the original language means to remake. It, it means to restore to its original purpose. It means to refresh. It means a debt paid. It means to be made over. But listen, notice when it is remade. Notice when it is to be returned to its original purpose. It is different than what it was before. Because it says he made it again. I've been born once, but I've been reborn again. Amen. He made it again. Another vessel. Are you glad this morning that you are the clay? You're in the potter's hand. You're on the potter's wheel. And he's making you into something that you were not before. You've been born again. You've been saved. You've been redeemed by God. And that God is making you now a vessel of honor. See, I'm seeing 
He was a worm vessel after he sinned. And that corruptness he passed down to us. But as we celebrated last week, Jesus came and he restored mankind to God's original purpose. And he makes us over again into another vessel, a new creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, Paul wrote the Corinthians, he is a new creation. He's a new creature. He's a new species. When you go deep into that, in the Greek, it means you're something that did not exist before. Before I became saved, I was the old creature. But when I became born again, I became something that never existed. It was just like and but listen to what he always said. Let me finish it. He made it as seemed good to the potter to make it. Next week we'll try. Some of you and some of us. I think we can do it. I say this just on a great real. Some of us need to take our hands off these vessels of his and let God do the work. Hello? Some of us need to stop trying to do the Lord's work in making people over and begin to realize that the Holy Spirit is the one that would take people over and pray in you. It seems good to the potter to make it. Now that's a regular word for someone. But now here it becomes a regular word for us today. Here's where I believe it becomes a living word for us. In verse 5, then the word of the Lord came to me, saying. Now, I know Jeremiah is saying this. I know he's saying that, that the word of the Lord came to me. But when you read it, instead of that me being Jeremiah, let's make it you and I. When you read it, let's realize that the Lord is one to say to us. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Then the word of the Lord came to the church. Then the word of the Lord came to Pastor Ken, saying and I believe he's saying it to the church and you and I today. You, you know, when we talk about the church, a lot of people are always quick to point out what's wrong with the church today. And believe me, a lot of what they point out is true. After all, Jesus called for five of the seven churches that he wrote to in the book of Revelations to repent. But we forget also that in every one of those churches, Christ found some good. Why don't we look for the good instead of looking for the bad all the time? I preach a series of messages that you can find on the church's webpage entitled, What's Right with the Church? It was a fourth uh, message series. But I can tell you this morning, what's right with the church is the founder of the church, who is Jesus Christ. I can tell you what's right with the church is the foundation of the church that we built upon. I can tell you what's right with the church is the Holy Spirit. I can tell you what's right with the church is the message of the gospel of the that God has given to us and God can still use the church. He's using us in spite of our failures. He's using us as a means to take this gospel to the world. He's using it to disciple people, to minister to our castle society. To fulfill Matthew 25, I was hungry and you fed me. I was sick and you, and you prayed for me. I, I was in prison and you came to me. I, I was naked and you clothed me. He's used the church today. Yes, we are more vessel. But guess what? We're in the hands of the potter. God has always used imperfect people. Because it's all he has. And we're still in the potter's wheel. And so he says to the church, he says to you and I, I know you want me to close. But in verse 6, he says, No house of Israel. And if we make this a raven word, we can substitute the name of the church here, the body. We can substitute our own name. In fact, I know that this is what I want to do. Oh, church! King! Pastor King! Listen to what I'm saying. Can not I do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So are you in my hand, O church, O child of God. Why will we limit the power of God by our complaining and by our criticizing? Why, I told you this gets real. Why will we limit the power of, the, of God in the church by our unbelief to work today when we are all that he has to work with on planet Earth? Listen to what God is saying. 
Can I not I do with you church as this potter did with the clay? What did the angel say to Mary when Mary said, Look, uh, how can I have a child? I'm a virgin. This is it's an impossibility. Medical science says it's impossible. Hello? But the science of medicine, the world of man said it's impossible. But the angel said, With God. With God. Church with God. Christian friend with God. Uh, we, we may look around us and we, we, we think the church is going to hail itself. But we can realize that when God looked at us, He said, Ken, with me, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. God's going to say the same to you today. I, I, I know I, got, I can't go on. But amazing grace, I sweep the sound that save a wretch like me. Look at the Moses, the Rahab, the Holly, David the murderer, the adulterer. Look at Saul who became Paul. Saul who was the murderer, the prosecutor, the Christian. Look at Dalton Thomas. Look at old foul mouth Peter. Look at you. Look at me. So, I, I follow saves good people and he saves messed up people and he saves evil people. Because he says, I'm the father, you're the clay. I'm the potter and you're the work of my Hands. So, I'm going to have to stop here. Because man's going to get real. Because now, the Lord wants to get into our business. The Lord wants to get into our flesh. He wants to deal with some attitudes that we've held on to for a while. He wants to deal with some of those things that we have been willing to, unwilling to let go. But he's saying, this is, I'm getting my people ready. I'm preparing the people. He's preparing us. He's getting you and I ready. I know it's uncomfortable right now. It's not always nice or comfortable on that potter's wheel because we've been squeezed. We've been reshaped. But in one of our previous messages, I brought out how that when the potter is working on that clay on the wheel, he starts walking on the inside with one hand and outward with the other hand. See, he starts working on the inside outward. And that's the Holy Spirit in our lives today. So during this time that we find ourselves in, we're going to find that God's going to use this to change some of our attitudes. God's going to use this to deal with some of those things in our flesh. It's a time called sanctification. But God's going to get real because He's separating the shaft from the wheat. He's separating the real church from the false church. Amen. Amen. I believe He's doing that. And I want us to be willing to be on the potter's wheel. I want us to realize that we're the clay. He's the potter. And when you look at that clay, there's nothing that clay can do in itself to bring about anything. It cannot change itself. It cannot purify itself. But in the potter's hand, you'll make it a vessel of honor. Father, we want to be vessels of honor. We want to bring honor to the kingdom. And so, Father, as we go on through these times of difficulty, help us realize you're still sovereign God. Lord, help us to realize that you would deliver us or go with us through everything that we have to face. God, you will provide anything that we have need of, even if it's just toilet paper. You can provide for us, God. You can provide for, us, for the people. But God, during this time of provision, as you are walking us through this thing, let the gospel shine. Lord, let lost people be saved. God, I pray for our families today who do not know you. I pray for people who are facing this difficult time and they do not know you. They don't have you. To be that strength, to be that refuge, to be that hiding place. 
And I pray, Lord, as they look to us, that we may not fail them. That we will give to them, God, that which you've given us and enable us to give. But most important of all, that we will give Jesus. We'll give Jesus. You're our potter. We're the clay. Form us. Shape us. Recreate us. And allow us to be filled. Not a vessel to be set on a shelf. Not a vessel that is marred. But a vessel that's becoming one of honor. One that will be filled with your grace, your power, and your love. And I pray, Father, today, if that's one among us, a one who is hearing the sound of my voice over the website, over YouTube, or Facebook, if they realize the sincerity of our plea, that they will feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Because Holy Spirit, unless you draw them, unless you reveal this to them, they'll remain lost. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will quicken that spirit, that you will speak to their hearts and cause them to realize that you're God. And our only salvation is in you. Our only hope is in you, regardless what man or the government may say. And that they will repent of their sins, ask for forgiveness, and begin to follow you and allow you to disciple them. I pray if that one here today that they'll do the, the very thing. We pray, God. Let it be. Let it become real. In Christ's name, amen. Did you get anything from the word of the Lord this morning? Get anything from the Holy Spirit? We appreciate the Holy Spirit. He's the only one that can make these things known to us. And I want to encourage you over the next day, several days and weeks, just to draw nigh to the Lord. You may not understand what all is going on and what's happening. Just realize our God is still in control. So I want to bless you. And again, as I close, I want to encourage you to continue to support your church, wherever it may be. Whether it's Emmanuel Worship Center or one elsewhere. Pray for them. Pray for your pastors in this difficult time. Pray for your church leaders. Pray for them. And let them know that you're praying for them and that you're encouraging them. And that you can't wait for the day that you'll be back with your family. Amen. Be a glorious time. So let me bless you. This is a blessing we speak every Sunday over the people of Emmanuel Worship Center. It's taken from numbers. But it says, may you be blessed by the Holy Spirit to be successful, to prosper, to have long life, to have fruit that remains, and a peace with nothing missing, nothing broken, and nothing out of place. Go with God, shout Jesus Christ with your house, and with everyone you meet. Amen. Thank you today.